Welcome to Moss Marketing Mondays, Moss Marketing Mondays, aka the M3 Podcast. Brought to you by Moss Marketing Group, bringing you everything marketing every Monday. Stay tuned for marketing tips and tricks you can use today. The M3 Podcast, marketing knowledge to help you succeed. Let's get started. Welcome back to the M3 Podcast. Uh, we got an exciting one this week. We got uh, part of the MMG crew over here, Dre and Ricky, and our guest, Austin. Yes, thanks um, for having me. Very thankful uh, for having you on. And uh, I think you have a very wide background, and you do something that's very interesting. And I was I was super excited when we lined you up to come on Yeah, to go over – everything that you do, everything that you have done, and what you're doing moving forward. So uh, thank you again for being on. Appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity. It's always good to be around you guys. So, so. let's – uh, once again, I always get criticized for jumping jumping in way too fast and going <laughs> right for what's happening right now. But let's start at the beginning of Austin on uh, what your story looks like from yeah. a kid growing right. up. Oh, from a kid. I was born – well, I was uh, I was actually adopted – um, to a family out in Utah, right? And so I was born on the islands, South Pacific Islands, and then I was adopted, moved to Utah, and just grew up normal Utah life, right? Um, raised LDS uh, in the Mormon Church, and and uh, it was it was cool out there, you know. Um, there's not a ton of diversity, but the diversity that Utah does offer, it's a lot of Polynesians, and so I never felt out of place or anything. Never, you know, even being adopted to a white family, never felt out of place, but. Um, the perspective I was given as a little kid, right, and uh, people would tell me, like, oh, like, you have such more opportunity over here. And they didn't say it like that, right? It was a lot more welcoming, but they just said, like, hey, like, there's a reason why you're here. There's a reason why you're adopted, right? Um, because look at the opportunity that you have to be here. And uh, I didn't really see it when I was younger, but definitely um, it came into play. And so I lived, like, you know, pretty much lived, like, you know, I grew up in a white family, so I hung out with white people. And then as I got older, I started to hang out with people more of my the culture, right, Polynesians. And I was able to see the difference from kind of an outside, outside perspective, right? And that's when I think uh, I started feeling different as an individual, as the way I think, you know, my mindset, just because I was able to – because I grew up, and uh, I don't want to get too racial, but, I, you know – um, white people are pretty established, right, in America. And they know how, you know, the laws work and they know how systems work. And so I grew up with that knowledge of, you know, business. You know, my grandpa was a farmer, turned, he raced quarter horses, you know what I mean? And um, ended up selling his farm for like 20 mil, you know what I mean? And so just, and then started businesses. And that all, sorry, that came from uh, being a home builder, right? Like that's what he was. And so I was introduced to stuff that, that was normal to me. It wasn't foreign to me. Um, and then I had my other side of the family that they explored a little bit entrepreneurship, but they were pretty nine to five, right? And so I got to see the differences, not as it happened, but I got to see it when I'm older, like, oh, this family was able to love like this when this family's conversations were like this, right? Um, so I had a unique perspective with that. And then when I met my own, um, my people, Right. I felt like an instant connection to the point where I was like, nah, this is like, you know what I mean? A little bit more laid back, um, a little bit more chill. Like, you know, Polynesians, like we're just chill. We eat a lot. <laughs> you know what I mean? We eat till we sleep and stuff like that. And so I remember I was like, I didn't want to like hang out with my white friends anymore because I'm like, dude, I like these guys better. <laughs> like playing video. You know what I mean? Like it was because uh, with my white friends, it was like, hey, what time are we going to the gym? What time are we doing this? I'm like, dude. You know what I mean? And with my poly friends, like, dude, we would just chill. You know what I'm saying? Like, just chill, and we would just kick it. You know what I mean? Nothing really to do. Um, and so I got to enjoy that. And then I got to see the in my life that what pushed, like, going into my adult life, right? Then I had to, like, go back to what, you know, in order to be successful – I realized I couldn't be chill. I couldn't, you know what I mean? And then I married into the Polynesian culture too. And so I'm, I look like them, but I have this complete different perspective of 
just because, and it's it's crazy how much culture um, has to do with the way you're raised and your mindset, right? And either the advantage or stigmas that you grow up with. Like, it's just, it's crazy how that is. And now, uh, well, and then in my 20s, right, so I started just seeing things different. And it started with football. I started being able to have a lot of huddle influence. And it, it, I started to be able to, um, when I saw people struggle, I, would, I was able to approach them after practice or whatever and just talk to them, be like, hey, what's up? And I was really easy for people to open up to because of my, I feel like with the dynamic of my upbringing, I had no judgment. You know what I mean? Because I didn't really have a place. And so that led into, um, and then being in Utah, Utah's like a mini, uh, what do they call it, Silicon Valley? Yeah. So yeah. Utah's like Silicon Slopes. And so being around that, um, I was able to see the different business. You know what I mean? So like I, it was kind of hard not to get involved in business. I got into software. Well, first I got into sales. And I was able to make a lot of people a lot of money. And then I got into training, and then I was able to make more people money. So my reputation as somebody, I didn't really have a reputation, but it was like, hey, he'll help you make money. You know what I mean? If you work That's with a good him, reputation. It's yeah, a good, it really is. <laughs> it really And I tell people that now. I like, dude, just be known for money. And you know what I mean? People will tell you what you are. Stop trying to figure out what you are. Um, and we'll get into that. But with that having the reputation, and then I got into software. Um, so problem solving and the reputation of money it kind of put me into the, the realm of software. And I was able to create a software for free pretty much. Um, I convinced college kids to develop it for me. And in return, I would give them work history so that when they graduated, they just looked so decorated. You know what I mean? And I didn't even know if it was real, but I talked to one person, and one person told me, that the hardest part after they graduated with a computer science degree was finding a job that paid decent because it was mostly entry level. It still was. It, it was a surprise to him. And so I'm like, well, if that one person has that, if that one person has that, then everybody has that problem, right? I figured. And computer science was so big in the little area that I lived in, like the two ma three major colleges that had this huge computer science program. And so um, going into that, I was able to start negotiating, you know, taking my sales, my sales skills and then turning it into a negotiating skill. And then I was like this kind of, and then, and then obviously software, I made a lot of money in software. Um, but I wasn't to the point where I was, it didn't feel right. You know what I mean? And during that time, I still remember the phone calls I would have with these college kids right college kids trying to tell them like trying to just boost them up you know what I mean yeah um and really getting into their personal life and so as much as I was um as much as I was a visionary for the company that we were building I was more of like a therapist almost right and I actually enjoyed it more and so when the software kind of got I was in a position where I could exit the software I was I did that and then I instantly, you know, you always hear it, like, whatever you do for free, try to make that your living. And I took that advice and I ran with it. And, in the, and even though I helped a lot of people, I was still insecure about putting myself out as a coach. Because it's like the people that were really close to me that saw me, you know what I mean, that saw me struggle. It's easy to impress somebody I met, never met. But the people that were really close to me, they're just like, I didn't want, like, it's weird, like this. And I won't say who they are, but there's like this one family that I really don't hang out with, but I always imagined what they're thinking when they see me as a coach. And it was so, like, you know what I mean? Um, and that, that led me to more of a spiritual take and like accepting myself, right? Going back to when I didn't fit, feel placed, placement in any, um, any group that I was with growing up that kind of brought me to more of like a spiritual side where like, hey, I have to find out why I'm not accepting myself. Because if I think you hit on something that it it's crazy because when we became friends, yeah. we're kind of in parallel lanes with what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And the coaching thing, it's funny when you're talking about like how you think about what that one family thinks. And it's 
I struggled for a long time. Like I've always thought that there was something like I enjoy that side of it just like you do. And I think that's why we hit it off so well. Mm -hmm. And I was so fearful of what people that probably weren't even in the coaching thing would think. And there's people out there like, oh, everyone wants to be a live coach now, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But it's like those are people that are so scared themselves to do it that it's something the people that are saying that probably want to do it really bad themselves. They just don't have the confidence to do it, so then they're going to bag on anyone that does do it. Right. But it's you have to think about all the people that where you're standing in life. There's some people that work a lifetime to try to be where you're standing right now. Mm-hmm. And to navigate those waters to – get someone there that much quicker and maybe overcome mistakes that you made that they don't have to and outline certain different, like different ways to navigate those waters is actually really cool. And it's something that I knew that like demeanor that you have right out the gate, that that was something that you could tell that you had a passion for that just like works. Right. Right. And yo, I recognize the same thing with you and it's, it's crazy when you see, and it is like, and it's funny, you have to surround yourself around the right people. And they're the ones who actually tell you like, dude, say it. And you're just like, well, I've, I know in one-on-one situations it works, but do they really care what I'm doing at six o'clock in the morning? Or do they really care what's on my mind? Right. And you have to surround yourself around people like, no, like put the camera in front of your face and start talking. And then it's kind of a surprise, like, the feedback we get, like, hey. And and even though I remember my first part, I made, like, a little Facebook group, right? And it's a free Facebook group for, like, my people, like Polynesia. I think you guys are on there. I think you guys are on there. I'll just share my thoughts. And and it's kind of discouraging because you'll see, like, 70 views, one like. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I know people are like, don't worry about the likes. But I, I still, like, I'm like, no, I created it. <laughs> it means a lot to me. I'm going to look at it. And it would bug me. You know what I mean? But then I would get, then I'd see them at like Walmart or I'd see them at like Target and they'd be like, dude, thanks for the post. I'm like, why didn't you like it? That's what I want to say something. Just say something. Like, hey, say that. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. And so, but no, it's, it's funny. The people that fall into the role of coaching, they, they have, like, we have the same insecurities as anybody trying something new. Right. And it's just, it's, but it's our job to not act like we don't. Right. But sometimes, literally, I'm just talking, and then I look at it, and I'm like, does anybody really give a shit what I want to see? Does anybody care what I say? But the the funny thing is, when you think like that, I, I thought the same way for a really long time. Yeah. I was like, no one would, mm-hmm. like, no one would pay to, like, have me help help them yeah. in any way. And it's like, it's one of those things that I find more enjoyment in that than anything. Mm-hmm. And marketing, I, I love marketing. I love everything we do. And... It's great when you help business owners. I enjoy working with small business owners the most Mm -hmm. because it's a direct one-on-one when I'm dealing with the owner and they scale a business and it makes a lot more money. It's a lot more rewarding, I feel like, to myself, to the company, that I just feel good about it. Right. We take on big, huge commercial accounts. They're a ton of money. And you do what we say we're going to do. They're like, yeah, that's what we pay you for. Mm -hmm. Like, there's no, like, there's no great feeling about it. When I started the coaching deal, like, I get on cloud nine when I get someone to sign up for $197. Yes. Like yeah. it is so cool, but it's also these people are texting us and it's like, they truly want to change their lives and business wise you can help people, but it's also a lot of people need help on a personal level. They need help on a, a finance level. They need help on a, in a lot of different areas. And it's really cool when you can bring insight to that and kind of shift I mean, on the simplest of things that so simple, it's even made me a better person mm-hmm. times 10 when I have to go over those things every single week. Yes. Cause I'm building out these coaching calls and I'm looking, I'm like, Holy shit. This is something that like I talk about, but I'm not really good at myself that I need to actually start working on more. 100%. So there's all these different things. When I talk about like time management, I talk about organization. I talk about like capitalizing on time and we have an individual in our call and I'm talking about when I'm getting up at 5.30, and she's like, well, I'm up at 4.30. I'm like, well, shit, I got to move up to 4.30. No, now. seriously. And it's like <laughs> the, the people around you, just everyone in this, like, community, it's like it's crazy how it drives. Yeah. I got I'm t- I have coached things and then implemented them the next day. Yep. So many times yeah. I'm like, hey, I'm, I should try that. <laughs> I should listen to myself. Yeah, I that's should li- really exactly. good Exactly. Yeah. I've done that so many times. And that's the cool thing about coaching. 
And to go off, with that, I think that's where the insecurity comes, though, because we look at our daily life, right? And it's like, dude, I'm not the, I don't have like the superhero body. You know what I mean? And that's what I'm going to answer. I'm going to go with two things. That's kind of where the insecurity comes from. It's like, who am I? Right. But then when you look at it, I'm working with the Chiefs player and he, he has a girlfriend that just came back into his life. And his girlfriend, after the, the breakup, she's like fit. Right. And it's funny. Um, I was talking to my wife and my wife was saying like, wow, she's really fit. Like she got really. And I said, no, no, no. She really got hurt. Right. I'm like, I looked at it from a coaching point of view. And I said, man, I said, you think she would have it all? You know what I mean? Um, she had a good career of her own and everything. And like, I look at it a total different aspect of like, no, no, no. Like you can tell when, like, I always say like, if I wanted to get fit, I would just ask my wife to like break my heart <laughs> or go to prison. Right. One of the two, like, Hey, I just want to go to prison or I want to like, just ask her back really hurt me. You know what I mean? And I promise you I'll come back looking so good. You know what I mean? Cause it, it, we all have that energy. We all carry the energy to look good and to be fit and to eat healthy. We all carry the knowledge and we all carry the energy, right? But something really has to trigger that for it to actually start taking place. And that's what as coaches, right, we're saying like, hey, you don't have to go through a breakup. You know what I mean? Um, I can spark that, right? And so that's what I do. I bring people in and I kind of got into high ticket coaching because I sent a video uh, to, to, a, to a person I did business with. And I said, hey, this is what I want to do. I want to help you bring, I want to enhance your mindset to the point where there's nothing in life that your mindset can't handle. You might be physically challenged. You might be all emotionally challenged, but your mindset will be so strong that you'll be able to check your physical, check your emotional, check your spiritual, and just kind of go through it. And um, he agreed, you know what I mean? And I did, it, I did it for free. And But that's how I got into high-ticket coaching. Is I was just, and so we go in and we break these individuals that everybody thinks has it together. And we break them down and say, I bring them a list of a consciousness. And I say, where are you at? And I wish I had it to show. Maybe we'll put it in like the notes or something. But the level of consciousness, so it's like, um, the highest and then the lowest, and normally they think they're in the middle, right? And one of the lowest is like shame and regret. One of the lower operating things, right, is shame and regret. And so when we, when we bring that in, they think they're in the middle. They're like, oh, I'm, I'm in the willingness phase. I'm in the phase where I'm willing to get better because I'm seeing you. And it's like, okay. And I said, so tell me the last 100 days of your life, you went 100% in everything you did, right? And they're just like, well, no. I said, well, do you regret not going? I'm like, even 95%, you know what I mean? And they start saying no. And I say, well, tell me. I'm like, well, that's work. And I say, well, what about your husband? I said, tell me that you've went 100%, that, you know, you didn't let one thing slip. And they're just like, no. You know what I mean? And so I'm like, you'll find out on that chart of consciousness that whatever level you operate at in one thing, it's, it's actually most things. And so most people are walking around operating at a two, to be honest, even great people. And it's like, man, like I can get you to a five. Now, once you're at a five, you can get yourself to a 10. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so, and you, I'm sure you see it. You see these people that people look up to like, dude, that person has it. And then you really break them down and they're just like, you're like, well, it's funny too. A lot of times I see this more times than not Yeah, of people look at what they want to be strictly from a financial spot. Mm -hmm. That is a, they look at people that like, Oh, they have the perfect life because they have money. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people with money that I would not trade my life for any day of the week right. for theirs. And they have a lot more money than me. Mm -hmm. I focus very much on my coaching. I'd say I probably have one of the more well balanced lives mm -hmm that most people like I have a great social life now with friends, family, the people I'm around, I want to be around my relationship with my fiance is phenomenal. Like we do not fight. Most people are like, what do you guys fight? Like we don't fight about anything like, but it's, there's nothing I should ever raise my voice to her about. There's nothing we should ever like, there's nothing that is big enough on this planet for us to fight about, to have that argument. 
Like, and it's just business wise, everything's great business, but it's like when everything's dialed in, like my biggest thing this year was getting more dialed in fitness wise. There's certain spots that lack on that, but it's also, if you're in a coaching position, you're selling on balance, you're selling on all these different things about helping people out with them. I am very much one that I'm never going to be hypocritical and tell people to do something I don't do. So it's like, I went out and bought a treadmill. I'm working on getting my steps every day. Like I go to the gym every morning, but I'm terrible about getting my steps like, and keeping your body in motion. But it's, I want to be the best version of myself 100% of the time to tell if I'm going to help other people come to that spot. So it, it's very much, I, I feel like the coaching makes you a better person if people are going to look to you. But I also feel that anyone that is looking for a mentor, a coach, anything of that nature, don't view someone strictly as a financial right. area that you want to be at. If you look at that person, you're like, hey, I want to have this person's social life. Mm-hmm. I want to have this person's relationship they have with their significant other. I want to have what this person has financially. I want to have this person's work life. If you can go through all those things and say, hey, this is who I want to be like, Mm -hmm. that's the person you should be working with. 100%. If you have someone that's like, dude, they have the worst relationship I've ever ever seen, there's something that's not clicking right somewhere else that's leading to that. They may spend way much, spend too much time at work and they haven't, like I'm very, very big with Madison, my fiance, yeah. on the vision of where we're going. We are a team of where we're going. To where if I have to work late, I never have a phone call of like, hey, when are you coming home? Like getting on my case. Like right. the, she knows what we're doing. Yeah, She's the same way. There'll be nights that it'll be 11 o'clock at night. She's still working. I know the vision of what we have. To where it's like we're on the same path all right. the time. It's not like we're going two different ways. We're going the same way together. Mm-hmm. But it's that's something that is very clear to us all the time. And to be fair, people can look at that. Yeah. And be like, well, if, if my husband made that much money, I wouldn't. Or if my fiance made that much money, I wouldn't question him either. You know what I mean? They look at it as a financial, just yeah. like you're saying. But and a lot of times it's, a lot of people look at it too, though, is like they don't trust their significant other being gone that long. They think right. something's happening. They think so many different scenarios right. go, goes through someone's head. But it's what's done between closed doors between you and Madison yep. is what makes it look so nice to the eye. Of us, right? Like, oh, wow, that's not, you know what I mean? And it, and I think people that are around us, under, like, there's sure. no one that's been around us that was like, yeah, we saw them getting a drop, drop down fight. Yeah. No one, no one has seen that. Like, I count one hand how many fights we've, like, arguments we've been in. Yeah. In 10 years. Yeah. That's like, big. But it's, also, we've never had a fight about financials. Like, that's just not something we've had. Like, we've always been on the same page. I don't, we've had split bank, like, we've had joint bank accounts since we were in college. Yeah. Like, I've never been fearful of her spending money. She's not fearful of me spending money. Like, we're, I don't know. I feel like in the coaching space, I feel like so many people target the wrong things that if you can go after having the best team partner, mm-hmm. I, I call Mass and I a team all the time, but it's like, she is a partner. She is that person. But then it's also like I've done the same thing business-wise. I've formed a team of people around me that I am so comfortable with that I can leave town. I, I, I trust every single one of them with everything. Yeah, 100%. And then it's when you start doing all those different things, and it's like it makes where when I wanted to do coaching, that was an easy step to make. Yeah. And every every single person here had had my back in doing it. Right. And they're honest. I get honest feedback. I know what we need to do. I know – that we got to progress, we got to keep getting better, and it's all these different things. But then the people that are coming in aren't always calling me directly. Right. I've had people reach out to me, then also talk to Dre, mm-hmm. and also talk to Ricky, like whoever it is. But it's become it's become something bigger. Yeah, one hundred percent. I want to elevate everyone. Yes. If I elevate everyone, does it make my life better? Hundred percent. Does it make everyone's life here better? Hundred percent. I think that's the thing people have to look for in like right. coaches and mentors or one hundred no whatever it is. Yeah. And that's what the thing I get, I'm gonna I'm gonna I love what you said because when I talk to people, I'm talking to them in their thirties, in their late twenties. You know what I mean? And I'm gonna talk about generational wealth a little bit because like and I, I might be totally missing it with you and Madison, but like kinda how you said, it sounds like you've had it for a long time. But people if you can get coaching in your high school, like I'm I big with my kids, you know what I mean? 
Um, I think I'm gonna get him a coach. I don't. I'm not gonna coach him, right? <laughs> You're because the one person they won't. Listen. They're the exactly. one person. Yeah, they like. What do you know, Dad? <laughs> yeah. But um, the, anyways, they um, getting them into like you know, and it's just simple things like with men, right? I always tell like I have a nephew that is dating, and I said it sounds corny as shit, but find a woman, go for a girl that you can look up to her dad. Like you look at her dad. And you say, I want to be that when I'm older. Because if you keep that in mind and you become that, that girl will know exactly how to accept you. And exactly where to push you and where not to push you. Because honestly, girls in a lot of arguments between men and women, their mom and dad, they'll take the side of their dad. A lot of women will. And so they will have grown up knowing what pisses them off. They will have grown up knowing where the argument starts with the mom and they'll be on the dad's side and they'll honestly, you know what I mean? And it's, and he's looked at me like, I'm like, dude, I'm telling you, if you go after a girl with no dad, I said, she's not going to know how to treat you because as men, and I heard this um, from a friend of mine, he, he said it in a podcast and he said, as men, when we marry our wives, right? We actually take on the role of being her dad. Her dad hands that over to us where we are the security and we are the protector, right? And we're the person she confides in. And she, and, and all of this, like the toxic masculinity and then the, the feminism, right? It's like, no, if you, a lot of women I talk to, I'm like, well, if you met a real, like the hate men, yeah. I'm like, if you met a real man and if you had one in your life, you wouldn't have this opinion. So you attacking me for saying that like my wife stays home and I do all the work and that I expect her, you know, I expect like her to do her job and me to do my job. And there's two, you know what I mean? We're equal, but we're not equal in what we do. We, we plan to be unequal and we went out and attacked the, but you also like, and this is, and there's thousands of relationships out there that work in a thousand different ways. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying any of them are right or wrong. Right. But the other thing, too, is you and your wife have a, a set outline of how things work and operate. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing that, that I see so many couples that have no outline of what's happening. Yes. And they're both just swinging around. And then just once in a while, they'll just cross paths and that's an argument. And then yeah. they zip back off in their <laughs> random directions. Right. But it's just a it's a car crash in a random They're both in parking lots just wide open. They just randomly yeah. run into each other once in a while. But there's no idea of what's happening. Right. Or you can go out and you see two cars that are driving the exact same speed down a highway, never running in, into each other, that is just like in perfect harmony. But it's because that conversation is had mm -hmm. that I'm I'm assuming that you and your wife, there's never a conversation of not understanding where one person stands. I feel like that is what happens. And sometimes it's a conversation you don't want to have. It's an uncomfortable conversation sometimes to have that. But when they're had all the time, it doesn't lead up to an argument. It doesn't lead up to any of those things. So it's just a sometimes a very small conversation that you avoid. You avoid ten of those, and it comes becomes one big argument. One hundred percent. That can be something a lot worse. And then you avoid them more. Yep. Then you avoid them more, and then before you know it, you're married to somebody you don't even know. Yep. That's. I mean, the people. A lot of people I work with. That's their complaint. Is like, well, they don't support me. They don't do. That. I'm like, well, how do they know you? How did you end up at this yeah. spot? Do they really, like, you went, it sounds like you went and grew into this great person in the world, and you kind of just took this side for granted, took the wife, and, or the opposite, right? And so it's like, how can you expect anybody to support you when they're, they're every day you come home, you're somebody new, right? Because yeah. you're going out and getting all this growth, and they're doing their thing, you know what I mean? And, I mean, I grow every time I meet you with you guys. I come home, and I know my wife's like, man, something's different about this guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, his pers like sub like and a conversation will come up like and I'll do it all the time sometimes I'll come home and talk about how the elites are running our world <laughs> and then other days I'll come home and talk about how just simple things like the trash man the trash <laughs> company was it was a gold mine and the person that invented let's collect trash like you know what I mean and it's just everywhere and it really depends on who I'm with you know what I mean but again going back to what what Dane's saying is like if we have that alignment of like hey she knows who I'm. She knows that she knows me well enough to know the type of people I'm surrounding myself around with. So that's what eliminates the phone calls. Is like she she's not worried and she trusts me that I'm doing what I have to do. 
right? To come back to the fold and say, hey, like, my my side's checked off, right? But and, and I think that that runs in relationships. Mm-hmm. And relationships, most of the time, once again, in the coaching lane, everyone's thinking male, female, this is our relationship that we have at home, whatever we're doing. The same thing runs in business. Everything, yep. And it runs, and I see it so much in businesses we work with, and I see it in very high-level individuals I'm friends with and very high-up positions in companies that they're not seen by their owners. They're not – there's no appreciation there. They're, there's one step away from being hired to a different company, and there's an owner that is out there that's not even paying attention mm-hmm. that I was uh, – watching a reel or video or something the other day from Andy Elliott. Mm -hmm. And Andy Elliott is a sales trainer out of, he started off in Oklahoma. He's in Arizona now. He's created this huge company. And he says that the guys that work for him are unrecruitable. And he said, he was on stage and he said, I'll give a million dollars to anyone that can come hire a guy that works for me. Wow. Cause he said they're unrecruitable. He goes, they are here. They're here for the vision of what I am building He goes, they're part of the team. He goes, they're unrecruitable. But it was like crazy that some, but he sees every single person that's working for him. If you're working for that guy, he is the definition of being a leader at the forefront that is at the gym at 430 every morning. His whole entire team joins him in the morning. He's doing all these things to elevate these guys. But the relationship he is building with them, it's the same thing of like a relationship where, where, one or the other parties goes off to find someone else it's because it's a broken relationship. People have broken relationships and businesses also. That's when someone quits yep. or gets fired. Like once again, it's two different paths, right. but it's the same thing is happening because someone's not holding up their end of the, the, the pie. And it's when you talk to them and you have those conversations, it's a lot easier to put those things in black and white and say, Hey, this is what has to be done. Yep. That's coming to the table and saying, Hey, my box is checked. Your box isn't. So there's, I think that the relationship in business, same thing goes in coaching, like same relationship. There's right. two paths. We have a job to do to help these people out. They have a job to implement these things. If they're not implementing these ideas or, um, I don't know, this roadmap that we're putting in front of to really help them out, then what's being done? So I, I think that, that relationship side is huge in a hundred percent of it. What exactly? One hundred percent of it, because that, that's why I said when we when we bring out the level of consciousness, the chart, they fall in the same category in everything. And then I'm like, do you see how easy that is? All you got to do is raise one, and the vibration of all your relationships will naturally vibrate up. And I'm like, a lot of people would be like, okay, let's fix this one, and then this one, and then this one. I'm like, no, just fix one. Fix the one that means most to you, because it's going to be the easiest to fix. And then it's like, and that's why I said with coaching. So I think, and I think both of us, and it's kind of, that's why we get along so well. Both of us, we know what it takes to run a company, right? We understand that to lead a company, I do have to show up about three to four hours earlier before everybody else, right? Just to send a message that like, if I meet you at 10 a.m., know that like I could take a nap and be done with my day. Like if you think I woke up at nine, like you're tripping. You know what I mean? And um, that, so th- you have to send that message as a leader. And I think that's why, for me personally, that's why I stepped into coaching because I can take that same mentality, right? And I can build that same leadership, but it's, in, in, it's not instilled in my system. It's instilled in their growth, right? I can instill a system of growth, and I'd be like, dude, you'll never leave yourself. So the same way the, the guy that said that, you can never recruit my my people. Literally, I think what we're doing is we're you can never recruit like my my mindset, right? And that, I mean, man, can you imagine a world? Not even a world, just a company full of men and women that have a mindset that's unwaverable when it comes to their not what they're doing, because a visionary can build what like, hey, this is what we're doing. But when it comes to, I always say. And I tie it into, I say it a couple different ways, but I always say a, uh, uh, a high-level person, right, is skilled, relentless, kind, and very dangerous, right? 
And if we could build those people that are skilled, relentless, you know, the mindset, it's like, dude, then we hand them off to the people that are leading a vision that can't be, you can't be recruited from. And it's like, man, like, then you look at it and like so many companies are a shit show. You know what I mean? And I've actually went into that. Like even I've, I've coached executives, uh, well, one executive, and you actually inspired me because you're the one who told me you're probably going to get into executive coaching. And so I coached one executive and then I'm like, you know what? I don't think the problem's with you. Let me actually train your people. And I said, give me 2000 bucks a person. And I knew he had a lot of people, right? <laughs> and I was like, give me 2000 bucks a person and I will create a course for them based on following you because you can't come in and say, follow me. But I can come in and say, follow him. I, I think there's a, a sense to that, but I also think that like when it comes to people following, yeah, I would like to think everyone here knows that I'm the hardest worker in the room. Yeah. Uh, majority of the time. Right. I, I would put myself That's important. Up, I'd put myself up against anyone. Yeah. But it's like, they also know that I'm willing to bet on everything on them. Yes. Like, and, because of that, I think it's. I, I would like to say I, they can agree or disagree, but uh, it's one of those things I've just always put it all up there. I've always, but I've always given that relationship. Once again, I, I've taken that to. I want to help everyone out that I can that's here. Right. But it's my picking of the people here. The coaching is great for everyone that's coming in from outside to build these leaders. But another thing that I got out of was I, I'm getting to build my, my own leaders here. 100%. So I'm building these perfectly formed leaders, this group that you talk about, like that company was like giving me goosebumps, when you fill a whole room with those people that think that way. Yes. It, you, you have it here. When I, I walk into Moss Marketing, sorry to interrupt you. When I walk into Moss Marketing, there is very rare where I walk into a company, even though no matter how many numbers, and everybody – will take the time to look up from their desk and wave. I don't think you realize how that says so much about the leader, right? Because everybody feels empowered enough that whoever walks through that door, they can look up and just say, what's up? But it's, like so many companies, the leader takes that privilege away and says, no, 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 no. Like only I can be great and you're here to work for me. No. Right. And they're it's not all like here, here to be greater than me. 100%. If I if I form a group of individuals that all become greater than me, I have accomplished what I'm here to do. Oh, and it's like, I feel like it it's too many people want all that greatness for themselves or whatever, which I understand like building brand, things of that nature. I, I know there has to become a spot, but I've also came in on days where I'm like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> like Ricky's a thousand times better on a camera, editing, doing all that stuff than I ever was. Yeah. That was one of my hardest things for me to take my hand off of. And Dre's way better at, at numbers and accounting and tracking invoices and reaching out to people and all these different things where it's like I let everyone have their space and it's like be the greatest at that space. And when you do that, it's like I feel like something magical happens and I feel like I'm just kind of in the back seat now watching this thing like grow mm -hmm. that it's like the coolest thing ever. It is. It is. And that's where a lot of that's where a lot of leaders will lose themselves because their ego will get checked because in the beginning you do have to set everything up. And then if you set it up correctly, everybody else will just take the role. And that's where I the I haven't co I haven't coached anybody going through that, but I've spoken with them. And that's where they failed is their ego checked in and like, wait, 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 I feel like I'm losing a little bit of value. And it's so cool because like I don't like it's not here. That makes sense. Like Dane is for his people. You know what I mean? I, and the fact that I feel comfortable, I don't have Ricky's number. I'll get your number, but <laughs> I feel comfortable texting Dre. I feel comfortable texting Dane. I mean, we have three texts going. I have one with you. I have one with you and I have a group text between all three of us. And like, I feel comfortable in either way. And that says so much about the leadership here is it's like, dude, I don't have an ego. You know what I mean? I do have an ego when it comes to, like you said, I'll outwork you any day, any night, but so will my guys. Yeah. Like try Which, any of us, like, you know what I mean? But don't try me like, <laughs> but for real, don't try me, but you can try any of us and you'll most likely come up short because this is a, 
this is what I've built. And so it's, yeah, compliments, man. Like, that's respect. Thank you very much. I love that. that means a lot. And that's, once again, with the, the coaching deal, they're, they're building. I feel that is my role as a leader now is to make sure that they're the most formed, well-informed, correctly built leaders for the future of the company coming on. Because I, I've, I feel like right now we have a foundation of what we're going to do. Mm-hmm. And now it's time to really scale and grow a business. And most people would get to a position where we're at right now and be like, hey, it's, now it's time to sit. Right. Like, I tell people all the time, like, we've, we've built a foundation. Now they're like, what? I'm like, it's go time. But that's, I feel fully at a spot where when people come on and they work under any one of the people that are here, mm-hmm. they can lead just as well as I can. And it's, I feel comfortable. I can leave. I can do these things. I can do whatever. But it's, that's where I think that coming back into the coaching and like what you do and just into the whole grand scheme of it, I feel like anyone at any position, you talk about working with executives. Mm -hmm. And the reason I brought that up to you at that time was once again, I've crossed paths with a lot of them that I thought from the outside looking in, I'm like, dude, they got shit figured out. Oh yeah. And I get in, I was like, holy shit. I'm like, they got nothing figured out. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're like, their headspace has to be a fucking whirlwind yeah. day in and day out. Like, and it, it's just one of those deals that, I don't know, just, I think that there's a huge market there for that. I think there, in the space of, I think everyone here probably has heard it a thousand times that I say progression is happiness. Right. That as human beings progress, they find happiness. And, it's crazy how education and self growth stops at the end of college for majority of people or end of high school. Like right. I could get on a whiteboard here and outline the, the life of 90% of our population, in like two seconds. Okay. You're born at what? Five. You go to kindergarten. I don't know. Five yeah, to four eight, five. 18. You're eight. going to graduate high school, high school. You're going to have four years of college. So at 21, 22 years old, you're going to graduate college. And then now you're going to work 40 years of your life until you can retire. You're going to be 62 years old. Now you get eight years. Maybe. Ten, yeah, I don't Assuming know. Assuming you were kind of healthy. Assuming <laughs> that you're healthy, you get eight years. Average person dies at, what, 72? Mm-hmm. So, or you get 10 years that you get to live off of retirement, kind of barely make it by, not nothing extravagant, and you die. I don't want to sign up for that. Everyone, everyone has just been bred to like, that's what you sign up for. Why? And, it, and it's bigger than that too. Well, I know it, I, I feel like we share this in common. If you do choose to sign up for that, come work with me and I'll make your life better. Because there are people that are like, no, that's actually, I want the pinnacle of my financial is to buy a $500,000 house and have one truck, one car, and maybe a commuter car and a boat. You know what I mean? And people can do that with going to college, getting a job, right? And they'll never question, because I learned that with coaching. Sometimes I would assume they wanted what I wanted. And so I jump into like a, uh, maybe like a high level, like maybe somebody that makes um, 150000 a year, right? Enough to say I make enough, but then not enough to say I'm rich. You know what I mean? Um, and I would assume that they wanted more money. And I jumped in and said, well, this is what you need to do. You need to um, use all your skills. You need to create a YouTube channel. You need, and they're just like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm actually, like, <laughs> I'm actually only here <laughs> because I'm having issues raising my kids. Because I and have given them so much, $20 on Fortnite, here, there. You know what I mean? And now they're so spoiled that I feel like they're so spoiled and sheltered that I, and I'm like, oh, that's the I'm like, why didn't you tell me there? Why didn't that you guy. ask? Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> but I assumed that they called me because they wanted my dream. And that's what I think is cool is like, um, that's us. You know what I'm saying? Like, we can I, I think that is room. pretty cool, though, because I don't think I've really looked at it that way. Uh-huh. That I think I do. Dreams think, are different. I do think a lot of times, like, I get that most people don't think on the level I do. Mm-hmm. But I do think a lot of times that I'm not going to say money buys happiness, Mm -hmm. but money buys happiness. Right. It buys freedom. It buys comfort. It buys those things that 
it can buy happen like relationship majority of relationship arguments issues come from a financial spot. Yeah. I don't have arguments with M- Madison because we have reserves of money. We have money sitting there like right. so that doesn't become an issue. That's why we haven't had those arguments. Like we've been we've worked hard enough. We've done what we've done to like make it to where we have money sitting there. Right. And can I intervene like, real quick? Yeah, go as for it. As a coach that tells me that you had a lot of money as a kid. Um, I'm going to say it's not what most people thought. Mm -hmm. There was times when we, our dad did very, very well. He's been very successful in everything he's done. And I'm not going to say that we came from some childhood. Like everyone thinks that we're going to have some like silver spoon. Yeah. Well, we we had money. Like, I'm not, I'm not discounting that. Yeah. But our work ethic of growing up is unmatched to what most people, most people thought that we just sat at home Got to play video games or right. do whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we grew up racing motorcycles. We traveled the country. We had a 40-foot diesel pusher motor home, yeah. 30-foot trailer behind it, fully sponsored race bikes. My dad had an airplane. We lived on 20 acres. Like, yeah, it was nice. Yeah, we had sure. We had it. But it was, we mowed all 20 acres every single week. Right. Yeah, we had a, a huge pool in our backyard. Pool had to be cleaned twice a week. We had a huge barn. Had to be cleaned every single week. Right. When we cleaned our garage, our dad would make us take everything out of the garage, completely clean it, and then put everything back in. And if he came home and there's a single speck in there, you empty the whole entire thing back out, put it back in. I remember the first time doing that, it was like 11 o'clock at night, and I have everything from the garage out in the driveway, yeah. putting it back in. And this is like probably 11, 12 years old. Mm-hmm. Like what chores are to kids now of taking the trash out or doing the dishes, that was shit that was just That was dumb. like that you better do that, right? That Bare minimum. You, he never, if he ever he had, had to ask on one of those, that were, was a different story. You were yeah. in your head ripped. Yeah. Off. But we had like real chores. Right. And there'd be times where he would, we had this deal on our uh, fridge all growing up or this whiteboard. He'd put everything that had to be done that week. And if it wasn't done, you didn't get to do anything on the weekends. Yeah. So it'd be a lot of times weekends would come around. We didn't get to do stuff because we didn't get what we had to get done. 100%. And it was probably a list that wasn't even doable. And so I'm, I'm not going to like say that there's like some, I'm not, there's no victim card. I I would take my childhood 10 times over again, but it's also gave us a work ethic to bring into the workspace. So that's what's formed us into what we are. Right. No, 100%. And And that's the reason why I said what I said, because I grew up never needing anything. Yeah. And so to, to me, living an average life blows my fucking mind. Yeah. I'm like, why would you want that? You know what I mean? But I had to make that kind of like, I, I had to be like, oh, well, just just because, like, it's hard for me to see it because I saw, you know what I mean, a contractor turned farmer turned quarter horse racer, right? And then I saw all these, and I'm like, I'm just used to seeing dope shit. But, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so if you're not dope, I assume that you're not as happy. But and that was my problem with coaching is I kept thinking they wanted it, right? And not everyone's going to want it to the extent that you want it. Yeah. Like, I think – really really large but it, it's also i have money that i could be a lot riskier with mm-hmm. but it's also i don't want to sweat money I don't, I don't want to live a uncomfortable lifestyle that's outside of my means i i most people think because mass and i have nice cars they think i've had people come in to our house that are our age but they they can't they've never wrapped their head around the amount of money that we've made yeah to our course everyone our age is like, wow, you're just, you finance out a lot on your cars. Like, that's just stupid, <laughs> blah, blah, yeah. blah. And I'm like, what you don't realize is we probably owe less on those cars than probably anyone at the house right now right. at this yeah. party that this person's mouthing off mm-hmm. to us at. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have the nicest cars, but I also make two or three car payments every month. Yeah. Same thing I've had her do. I have like, we've traded those cars in. Now when I trade in for a, your, I, I trade in for a $90,000 car, I had $50,000 down. Mm-hmm. I go, so I'm assuming my payment's probably less than yours. Like, right. But and it blows their mind when you, they figure it out. They're like, what? You know what I mean? But most people but think you're they... just leveraged to the max. Yeah. And I've been very smart. Like, I could have a boat right now. I could have a lot of toys, but I don't have toys. Yeah. That's not what I want right now. I want to scale a company. I dump everything into this. Right. Like, I dump everything into, if I have additional money, I give it to people here. I, yeah. I give Christmas bonuses. I do the stuff that makes it better for these people. Yeah. That makes a lot more sense to me than having a boat. 100%.
But it's like that's longevity. That's a, the long play. And too many people think so short term. Yeah. And, but it's also, I can get, I'll get uncomfortable money wise when it comes to this Mm -hmm. on like pushing scale. Yeah. But it's like, I, I never fear like making a house payment. I never fear like eating like the necessities of life. I look at my overhead of life is pretty low. Yeah. Some people would say it's high in relevance to what, what they would have to do to have what you have. And that's what, for me, I'm glad you brought that up because that was a huge downfall in my game is until I brought the spiritual side in, I used to argue with people. I used to be like, hold up, motherfucker. <laughs> like, let me, te- let me, let me educate you, right? And I, it would get so, and then when I got spiritual, I started recognizing, I started recognizing just like, this is, like, I have the ability to, talk to somebody on their level and figure out if they want to be raised or if they want to be proud. And if you want to be proud, I'll applaud all day. Right. And it's made me a better person because I used to argue with those people. Right. Like people like that, like, Oh, why do you, Oh, you must have this. You must have this insecurity if you have this, or you must have like, what did that cost you? Right. And I'm just like, actually, you know what I mean? And I'd go into it like, Actually, and I'd start educating them, like, <laughs> if you buy a car over this amount of weight, it's actually a tax write-off. So either way, I was going to lose it to Uncle Sam. So it's 90000 here or there, and uh, it's already paid off, and I plan on giving it away next year. So you might as well drive something cool. Yeah. So I'm like, and if you were a little bit smarter, I'd probably give it to you. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> because I'm like, it's already paid off. Yeah. I'm like, literally, I had to pay it off. I had to buy the truck I bought, and I had to pay it off. I had no choice, or I'd just pay taxes. You know what the I mean? The money's gone either way. The money's gone either way. It's not my money. And they're just like, what do you mean? I'm like, and then I would get mad because I'm like, well. Why don't you know this? Yeah, hold up, motherfucker, one more time. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, you uh, like you get your taxes taken away from somebody like me. Like, we, do, we hire a team to take your taxes away before you even see them. And so it's like, and then once I got spiritual, I realized that I need to stop. You know what I mean? Um, I need to sit back and be like, man, what a blessing to be in a situation where I was able to absorb the knowledge that I did in how the world worked to how the money worked and, and, and then be blessed in my, you know, my unique situation of the perspective I had, you know what I mean? And I was just like, man. And so when the spiritual side came in, it took away a lot of, I used to have hard feelings towards what Dane was saying when people would challenge me, dude pissed me off (laughs) like it it really did and so it's made me better that spiritual side right and that's honestly what we find um as a coach is like that spiritual side has a ton to do with just a minor adjustment and I always use the analogy of kind of what you were saying with the cars I use the analogy of the airplane right and you take an airplane and you move it one inch to the right if it's in LA and it's facing New York you move it one inch to the right and it will end up in Florida. I might be off on the metrics. So it's a big difference. <laughs> but it's a huge difference, just one inch, right? And it's like, you know, all these people are going through life and their finances are good. Their mental's good. Their physical's good. And they're forgetting that there is a spiritual side to things. And so a lot of these people, they, they peak at all three of those things. And then they get to say, well, I want more and I know there's more. And it's like, dude, just uh, let's adjust one more thing. You know what I mean? And so that's kind of, it boosted me because... We're in a world, and you know this as well as I do or better, we're in a world where everybody's a coach. Yeah. And they're shitty. I mean, a lot of them are just like because they're, they're chasing money. But there's, I'll also say there's a lot of people that are coaches that have no credentials to be coaches. 100%. And there's, there's probably definitely people that are w- way more successful than me mm-hmm. that look at me and say, hey, he doesn't have the credentials to be a coach. Right. That's fine. I, I may not have the credentials to be a coach. But there's also people that we have in our coaching group that make a shit ton more money than I do. Mm-hmm. But they have a respect for a relationship I have. They re- have a respect for the, the way that the Moss Marketing Group's ran. Right. They have a respect for something else that there's so many things. I don't care what level you are. And this is a, a frustration. I am never too good to listen to anyone. There's a lot of people I've ran into that have not made it anywhere in life or I don't want to say anywhere, but they haven't like started scaling in business. They haven't started like doing a whole lot, but I've learned a lot of things from them. 
And I learn things from people every single day. And it's crazy on when you're listening to people and you just open up your mind because I've had a life coach before when I was in the car space. Yeah. And I was too close minded to listen to him at all. Every single time I was like required to be on this deal. Yeah. And I listened to him like that motherfucker. I don't, I'm sick and tired of talking to him. Like he can't tell me what to do. Right. Like blah, blah. He just doesn't. Have understand. you done this though? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, well, if you haven't done that, you have you, you asked can't. for a raise? <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah, yeah. yes I, I did that like three times. <laughs> they told me no, <laughs> but it's just like, it was also like the credential side, things like that. I didn't want to listen to that guy because I didn't believe he had the credentials. Mm-hmm. So as I've matured and grown more, everyone has value. Every single person. Every single person has value. They just have to realize that they have value. And we sat there at the conference in Utah. I remember when the muscle and uh, Rob Bailey and Sean Whalen are all standing up there, and these guys are all coaches. And they're like, who in here has a coaching group? And not a single person in the room raised their hand. I'm like, so you're telling me it's just randomly the three guys that made it on stage are the only three coaches that are qualified in this room. And then I'm sitting there listening to these guys' stories. I'm listening to uh, Andy Fursellis' story. I'm sitting there putting myself up against these guys at 28 years old, and I'm like, looking at Ricky, and I'm like, we're starting a coaching group when we get back. But it was chapters to chapters. I'm like, I've blown these dudes out of the water. Mm -hmm. We're just getting going. But it's crazy when you open up your mind to that, and you like, you sit there and you think of what the value is that everyone has. Yes. And... When, I, when we started our coaching, like when we started Square One Coaching, it was, I was a little nervous because I'm like, if I start this and no one signs up, like, gonna that's kind of awkward. That's going to be a kick to the ego hard. Yeah, yeah. And I started like the first day, like I'm at the house and Ricky's like, I'm in Quick Trip. The, the um, Stripe account, it wasn't taking payments or something. He goes, we, someone signed up. I'm like at home jumping up and down for like $197. <laughs> and right. I'm like, no, but I'm it's, like, yeah. It's but needed because you're being vulnerable. It was. And you need that that kickback. But it was – now it's like every single week we have multiple people signed up. They're coming 100%. into the, the ecosystem of what we're doing. And I have people that text me now that are in it that I hear their success stories. And it's like, like I implemented this thing. It's changed so much. Yeah. And it can be the smallest thing. Like I used to think that you had to move mountains. To like sometimes, like you said, that one inch. Yeah, that one inch. That one inch can be – something in organization mm-hmm. that you can capitalize on so much more of your yeah. time. That one inch could be a li- being a little bit better communicator. Right. That one inch could be setting your goals and figuring out what you have to do weekly or monthly to hit your yearly goal. And it's like that one inch can be all these different things. That yeah. When you go over that one inch is different for everyone. And it's crazy. Like when you start doing that for all these people, you start getting that feedback. I was like, Holy shit, there's something to this. I'm like, yes, and I don't. I can't even explain the feeling that comes from it. But. It is unexplainable, and it's crazy because it's uh, when we're authentic to ourselves. Someone will. Someone will follow. Like someone will. Like if a million people were to watch this podcast right here, there would be some people that'd be like, "Dang, Ricky's watch was nice. Something about this guy. You know what I mean? Or his demeanor is nice. You know what I'm saying?" And then, like, Dane's it, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it doesn't, what we say, if we put it out there and we get it to as many ears as possible, as many eyes as possible, we will find the people that we can, that we, that, you know what I mean? Because it really is a preference. You so, know what I mean? Yeah, and then, so Ricky's in, Ricky and I are both in coaching groups. Yeah. That led us to Utah together. Right. Uh, what, I don't know 100% of what, like, I know I'm in the muscles. Yeah. So Limitless Society, mm-hmm. and he's in Rob Bailey's, was it calculated? Clear, calculated, and vicious. Yeah. So what? what is a lot of it that Rob goes over in his calls that, like, really elevate what he does? So a lot of it is even just the perspective of, like, he talks about he doesn't even mess with any project or anything if it doesn't make him at least 20 grand a month. Yeah. Or he really likes it. But just being around, even though it's not like physically in person, 
unless it's a conference, being around people that are operating at a higher level just opens your eyes to what's possible. 100%. And that's been one of my biggest takeaways from it. How have you implemented that? I'm curious. Because you take something like, and it sounds like, you know what I mean? Um, that's like dope that you have this like two requirement. Like it's either I have to love it or it has to make me 20 grand a month. How have uh, you been able to implement it in like that? You yeah, know what so, I mean? In your daily. So part of it's like I used to have a ton of like side hustles going on. Yeah. That they just suck out all the energy. Mm-hmm. And it's not something I'll do forever. And the upside isn't high enough. Yeah. To be worth my time. Right. Like there's so many other things I could be doing that are going to be better in the long run. Like, sure, I could go do something and make like a couple hundred bucks, mm-hmm. but that's not going to affect me in 10 years. Right. 100%. That's what's that's, up, man. That's a, we talk about a lot that yeah. implicating that into marketing and everything is how sustainable something is long term. That a lot of our marketing accounts, I look at things that we have to adjust early on if we want it to be sustainable long term to always work. Because, say, dealerships, the reason I like dealerships a lot, inventory yeah. is always shifting. So you can the amount of videos you can run is really indefinitely. Okay, yeah. So different things of that nature, that's why product marketing, different. if you have one product, it's really difficult mm-hmm. to run different styles of marketing all the time forever. There's yeah. going to come to an end spot where they say, hey, the ads run, the content's there, like, else could we do what more can you change yeah that's why i like a lot of like personal branding within things also because personal branding is indefinite move it's huge so um and i'm actually anybody watching i'm i'm trying we're really trying to push that um even with the the athletes that i'm working with is and i still because we talked about it and i'm just going to be transparent about it because i know people i know my people are going to watch it and I'm gonna tell them to fast forward to this part and then go back, <laughs> right? But the the ability the not every day you're given a platform where you have hundreds of thousands of people guaranteed watching what you're doing, yeah, watching what you're saying. Um, it's not every day, and these a lot of these athletes are put in a situation where um, they think they're just there to play ball, and they have all. Of, and I'm not every one of them haven't. Something in their head, like, I, I'm more than this. And every one of them I've talked to have a plan of, like, going into retirement. But they think it's, like, real estate. And they think it's, like, it's like well, how fulfilling can real estate really be? You know what I mean? I'm like, yeah, if your end goal was a lot of money, then yeah. But I'm like, you're not looking at the long term of the, the platform that you're on. I'm like, it's addictive. The other thing, too, though, is, like, when you yeah. look at what you're saying, what's the average – lifespan of a NFL player like career wise or career, life career uh, wise. probably shorter than 10 years okay yeah so say you take shorter than 10 years I would assume that number is even smaller yeah because I see a lot of people come in they're out within oh yeah yep two years yeah, you're right. and they may get a chunk of money but real realistically that lifestyle that you just got a glimpse of mm-hmm. are you going to be able to make that work with real estate right and if and I'm saying that's the only way that is remotely possible is if you're going in, you're not spending any of the money that you're getting and you're dumping a hundred percent of it into real estate mm-hmm. and you better have good CPAs. You better understand how taxes work. Make yep. sure you don't get caught with your pants down, but it's like they do all these things. So you're just, you're going to tell me you're not buying the cars. You're not buying the watches. You're not buying all the bling. You're not buying the houses, whatever it is. No jets for you. These guys get into it and that's what they want to do really fast. And guess what? They can do that. They capitalize on platform via the, the social reach that they can get. 100%. And we were talking about before that the NFL, the UFC, the NBA, whatever it is, people follow players. Yep. People do not follow the NFL because they want to hear what the fuck the NFL has to say today. <laughs> yeah. Nobody. Like, no one's like, oh, my God, I'm getting on Instagram. What's the NFL have to say this morning? Yeah. Oh, my God. Like, like what what the UFC released this morning? No one cares about that. Yeah. People care about the people competing. Those those are the people with the audience. That's the reason they get paid. They get beat, they get paid because they are the entertainment. Tom Brady gets paid what he gets paid because he any human being in the United States you go to him they know who he is. Yeah. There's a reason that he has social media posts going up all the time. There's a reason he has endorsement deals. Patrick Mahomes has endorsement deals all the time. 
Right. There's a reason Travis Kelsey did a commercial for Shane Co. and got paid one hundred fifty thousand dollars for like an hour. Yeah, it's because he has a platform. He has an audience, mm-hmm. and all these guys have the same opportunities. They're just not jumping on them. 100%. We we talk about the guy. He played for the Lions. I think he played for Cincinnati. I don't know who he plays for now. I was on practice squad. Yeah, now he's a practice Dude. squad guy. Yeah. Has millions of followers on TikTok. Dude's probably making more money from TikTok yeah. than he is from the NFL. And majority of his posts when he started was like what they're eating that day. What it, what it's what yeah. it's like to eat in the what day of like an NFL food. player. Yeah. And even if you take the money out of it though, yeah. like say say they've made enough that they're set. The money's not an issue. Once they get out of the league, you've got a lot of years left and you have such an impact on people when you're in it. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, what are you going to do when you're out? 100%. If, if you're building a platform while you have that attention, it just keeps the door open yeah. down the road. I actually I speak with them a lot about that and I compare it to the war, right? When, when men went to war and they came home and they all bought motorcycles because it's the closest thing they could get to the adrenaline rush. Yeah. It's the same thing is like that lifestyle is so addictive. Like keep the, I promise there's some people, there are some people that are like, I want to disappear. Yeah. So yeah, disappear. You know what I mean? That's like the one to 2%. Right. (laughs) But most people, they're so addicted. Like, I mean, uh, when when I went to Cincinnati and we walked into a mall, like it was cool for me just being looked at, even though they weren't looking at me, they were looking at the player. You know what I mean? And then they shut the store down. The security goes in the store. And then just everybody's watching this one player look at shoes. He's just looking. He's looking <laughs> at the wall. And everybody's like, oh, my gosh. Like, what is he going to choose? You know what I mean? And he chose, like, a pair of white Air Forces. I'm just like, dude. It's so, like, seriously. Like, it's crazy. And the, but it's the platform. And yeah. I'm like, when you leave that, it, how are you really going to take leaving that? Because, like. Some people embrace it. Some people go, oh, I did my time. And you know what's funny? It's most of the time those guys are doing that right now. Mm-hmm. They don't look at it in the now to yeah. capitalize on it. Right. Like what Ricky was saying. And then it's two years after they're out of the league, then they want to try to capitalize on yeah. it. Yeah, then they start a podcast. But yeah. then guess what? Like your your limelight's gone. Yeah. Like you missed it. Exactly. Like that's if Travis Kelsey was here, which I feel like he's maybe a, a – kind of an outlier because he does everything that we're speaking of doing right now. Yeah. He's built his platform, but you have, I don't know, some random player from the chiefs that everyone knows and why he's playing. If he started working on his platform now in 24 months, he would be, he would have the audience to do whatever he wants. If he wants to sell t-shirts, Tyree kill has started his own clothing line. Now I saw that because he has an audience. Yeah. So it's whatever you want to do and you have the audience to sell it you now have that, that avenue to do it. 100%. Or you wait two years afterwards, the audience is gone, you try to do something, you're trying to figure out, you burn all your money, and it's, that's like saying, do you, who was the, um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of like a, a funny, a weird stat of just some random player on the Chiefs that you would know from like five years ago. That somebody's like trying to be something now. That's So I have, I have a little bit of an example and it's not the most fair because social media wasn't what it was now, obviously. Okay. But like uh, Dante Hall, yeah, used yeah. to be the guy. Like there was oh, that was. there was that on two Madden? year stretch, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dude. And there was that two year stretch where he just was on a roll. And like if social media was around then, because I, I stumbled across oh. his account like a couple years ago, has like maybe a handful, a couple thousand followers. Yeah. Right? If social media was a thing then, and he was able to capitalize on that, he would still be. Huge. We need to try finding him and get him on the podcast. No, we should. Yeah, one hundred percent. I could. No, but it's crazy. Like those guys that were at the top, like top level. That if they just capitalize on what is right in front of them, and it's not going to be the cheapest, easiest thing to do right now, but it's going to set them up for life. Yeah. You go get a couple million followers on, on Instagram or Facebook or whatever. Companies are paying you. Fifty thousand dollars to review a product. Companies are paying you to endorse stuff. Like, it, and people don't realize that how yeah. much companies paid it to endorse. Oh, it's wild! A it, ton. Yeah, you and it make if, millions a year having a couple million followers on. And then yeah, if you like, social. if you take out like Patrick Mahomes, like he yeah. has a five hundred million dollar contract. If you take like those guys out, and then hit like your average NFL players, like they would probably make more off yeah. social media in the long run 100%. for sure. Or the team the would make more. It's funny that. 
I'm going to use an example. We just reached out to Alex Smith, right? Because I was looking for cheap and like cheap <laughs> people to talk to. And I, I, that's not, I'm not saying Alex Smith is cheap, but it's funny because his prices went down to speak in Kansas City, right? Because the only thing we have to compare him against is a quarterback, is being a quarterback. Yeah. If he would have used – because at one time, Alex Smith, we all believed in him, right? As Chiefs yeah. fans, we're all like, hey, that's who we're going with, even though he just shows, throws short passes. That's He's who we're going with. He's taking us to the promise line. He's take, right, at one point. Yeah. But now that he didn't build a platform – I'm not saying he regrets it, but I'm just saying an example. If he would have had Moss Marketing <laughs> – Build him a platform. To be fair, we weren't to a thing where, <laughs> Right, right, right. But if he would have had a, boss, a company or people around him that said, hey, let's build a platform to see what Alex Smith really does on the off and build a different, something different from, you know what I mean? From, uh, what's it called? From Patrick Mahomes. Then he would still, I'm not saying he's not valuable, but he would be more valuable coming to Kansas City because now all of the fans would be fans of him on another aspect and they wouldn't even care if he wasn't the same quarterback Patrick Mahomes is. Yeah. And that's that's when people follow people. And that's like yes. Travis Kelsey will always be Travis Kelsey because he's his quirky self, like his podcast. I laugh my ass off like when I watch those. Yeah. But it's like after football, I would still watch those. Yeah. He is building his own platform of people. Like that, uh, Pat McAfee, that's a perfect example. Yeah. He's crushing it now. He played for a few years. He was really good. Yeah. Got out, and now he's doing something with social media. And, right. But it's they have probably the easiest platform to go out. They're getting a free ticket to sign. One hundred percent. And say, hey, pay for this ticket, and this is the the rest of your life ticket. Mm -hmm. This isn't the ticket. Hey, of like maybe you can become an announcer somewhere. Yeah. Like if you're really good at speaking. Maybe you might catch like something like as a you might, a yeah. secondary coach somewhere or some shit like that. But it's just like, no, here's your guaranteed signed ticket. You're given the platform. You're getting to stand in front of a, uh, I don't even know how many a thousand per person audience yeah. every single week. Capitalize on it. Right. Well, we're trying to grow an audience over here with no one knowing who we are. <laughs> like we're from Kearney, Missouri. Yeah. Like, and. That's what is crazy is, like, you, you take nobodies that are trying to grow something, and it can be done. Right. But then you have people that have a, like, guarantee that, hey, you can do this tomorrow. Yeah. And they're like, ah, that's, that's not worth me messing with it right now. Right. They don't see the value. Like, it, it, does, it frustrates two, me. Two years yeah. later, once I'm out, yeah. Yeah. I'll revisit this, and it's not going to go yeah. as planned, yeah. and then I'm going to wonder Once why. I can't yeah. afford a and Ferrari, I tell them then I'll straight, hit you up. I'm like, nobody's going to care in two years, and you're not going to be able to afford it. Yeah, because I'm like, if you're coming to me for marketing in two years, that means there's an issue with money. Exactly. That means something. Yeah. It might not be your hurting, hurting, but something in your red flag is going off. Like, okay, I gotta revisit all of the stuff I turned down. But then two years after that, like that ticket's not signable anymore. Right. You may be able to try to make it happen. Like it's going to be tough. But look at uh, What's the dude that's just wrecked everything? He was on the the Full Send podcast. Antonio Brown. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. look at that dude's reach on anything. And he, I mean, he is a strange cat. Yeah. Like, it doesn't matter how weird or strange or whatever you are. Like, yeah. those guys, he's taken the platform for everything they're worth. Like, right. I mean, he could post something and be on ESPN tonight. Yeah. Like. 100%. And everyone's going to probably see it before ESPN even gets a hold of it. Yeah. And that's the crazy thing with <clears throat> social and just all of it. Like, yeah. And then you have those guys. And I think the biggest fear is this is what one player said to me. And I know we're running short on time, but this is what one player said to me. He's like, I do not want to be a LeVar ball. Right. LeVar ball. Yeah. The guy that just kept marketing everything. I'm the best pancake maker. I'm the best. You know what I mean? No, my boys are going to make, you know what I mean? And he spoke so crazy that's the image that these some of the ball players that i speak with about marketing themselves are like i don't want to do that i'm like the cool you know and i have to like coach him i said you don't have to do that i said again he went to the extreme but also look at the platform he built how long ago was that too the var ball is uh oh four years ago okay but if you look at someone like that yeah in today's space you build 
a YouTube channel that mm-hmm. has a ton of traction. Yeah. You're not, you don't even have to sell product there. You could, people watching your stuff. Right. You build an audience. Google is sending you a check every month. 100%. Yeah. Like you're going to get a check from Google yep. for that. And you build a big enough audience. You're going to have big podcasts around the country reaching out for you to go on to speak. You're not selling anything. Going on to speak and tell your story, and they're going to pay you fifty thousand mm-hmm. dollars to come tell your story, hundred thousand dollars depending on the podcast. So now all of a sudden you're getting paid to go on podcast. You're getting paid from Google. If you want to go do a commercial somewhere, they say, "Hey, this person has a big enough following. I want them to do a commercial." Some companies may say, "Hey, we want you to try to sell razors or whatever it is." Yeah, you don't have to do that stuff all the time, but you can catch one of here, here or there if the deal makes sense. And it's a paycheck. Yeah, and it's a paycheck, and it's all because of timing. Yep, that's the biggest thing that I'm talking to you guys. <laughs> the biggest thing is they. I need them to understand timing. Opportunities right, right now are we have the largest opportunities in front of us right now than ever in history. Right, and if people can't see that, business owners, individuals, whatever it is. Right now, we are standing at a benchmark at a turning point that I think is just as big as when the internet started. 100%, yeah. That we have more millionaires being created now than ever before. And almost 100% of them are coming some way through the digital space. Yep. I and, totally agree with that. And it's, it's crazy with what is right there in front of us. You just have to be willing to grab it. Yeah. And it's a... Uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm big on the opportunities. I'm big on what's out there and what, what can be done. Yeah. After uh, this podcast, I would have never guessed. Oh, it's, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's crazy. And, like, yeah, it's um, the, the opportunities are not going anywhere. That makes sense? I believe in five years you'll still be able to start a YouTube channel. Oh, yeah. The timing, it's just, like, understand the timing, right? Understand that... Um, and also understanding the universe, not universe, not to get too spiritual, but like there's a reason why you're hearing the stuff that you're hearing. Does that make sense? Like yeah. there's an absolute reason. It's it's just, you know, but it's just are you gonna be able to as soon as you hear it, is it gonna trigger something? And if it's not, go get a coach. <laughs> <laughs> go get so, a coach that will help you trigger. Summing up this call, we're gonna have to say get a coach. Yes. <laughs> Capitalize on your opportunities. Yes. Be in front of people. And you have to capitalize on them now. Now. Yeah. Because in five, when you're out of the league for five years, it's not going to matter anymore. Right. Yeah. And that's that's, that's anything. That's anything. Anything. Business yeah. owners, whatever it is. Yeah. We could we could have a whole podcast on Well, you, you told me something this morning, Dane, on waiting. Why wait? I It absolutely blows my mind. Blows my mind. Like when people, there's people that are like, hey, I have a 2023 resolution that I'm going to scale my company to X, Y, Z. And I'm like, all right, what are you actively doing to do that? Uh, Oh, so you're going to do nothing fucking different and you expect different results. Right. Or you speak to someone and they're like, yeah, let's wait two weeks. Why? What the fuck is the point? Why wait to start growing? That's the same, same thing with the people that talk about I'm going to be in the gym next week. Then I'm going to be in the gym next week. I'm and you should it. see the workout these people write for themselves. One mile. Yeah. <laughs> hour and a half of lifting. Read two books today. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They're, and because they waited. And so yeah. they, uh, procrastination is a feeling that we feel. It's an emotion that we feel. And so when we feel that emotion, we end it, we try to reinvent ourselves on a Monday. And I'm like, bro, like, doesn't work that doesn't and I, work I'm that very way. much like a action taker. Mm-hmm. There's nothing I hate more than idea people. There, for every fucking 2,000 idea people, there's one action taker. Yeah. I have so many people cross my desk, business owners, they have this idea, they have this idea, this idea, this idea, and none of them want to take action on what action needs to be done. That actually is one of the most things that you said to me. Sorry to interrupt you. The, what you said to me, well, I'll always remember you said, if I am talking about something today – the people around me can expect it to happen within the next week. Yeah. Something is going to happen because I don't talk about stuff without doing it. No, I, I feel like that that's your word. with be, If you just give people ideas all the time, they really don't believe in you. Right. 
And it's, once again, the waiting people that are always waiting for whatever, yeah. waiting for this, waiting for that. Like, I really, a lot of times, have, like, trust issues with those people. Yeah. Like, I wouldn't call that person if it, it's, like, always a waiting person. Like, and it's also a confidence in those people. Like, those people aren't confident in themselves. They're not confident. Like, what what is going to change in two weeks? Yeah. What is going to change in a month? You doing everything the same today as you do next month, as a month after, nothing fucking changes. Right. And I don't know where in human history they thought just doing the same shit every single day that all of a sudden, like, everything was going to, like, 2023 is my year because, I don't know, it's 2023. That's most people's fucking resolution. Right. It's comforting. It's comforting yeah. to their brain. It's comforting yeah. to their soul. They're just like, oh, man. You know what I mean? I, I love the people that, like, Sunday, they're like, tomorrow I'm starting my diet, so I'm going to eat as much as I can <laughs> right now, right? Yeah. And they're over there, and I'm just like, dude, like, like, you know what I mean? They, it's just, go get a coach. I'm yeah. just playing. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I hopped on that chicken and rice Monday. Yeah. I did it for about two weeks, and I was like, wow, <laughs> that was a really bland diet. That was yeah. a pretty, pretty harsh transition. Was, Maybe we should just cut out, like, the sugary drinks. Yep. Go from there. But the other thing with social media, though, especially in waiting, yeah. is, like, it's an exponential growth. Mm-hmm. Especially with YouTube, Instagram, all that stuff. So if you wait those two years, you'll never be able to make that up. Because that's two years of that exponential growth that you miss. 100%. And that's, I don't know, I, I don't, I'm not a waiter. I, I've never been a person that waits. I'm like foot on the gas, full speed all the time. Yeah. But I think that also contributes to what I, I've done in life. Like, 100%. And if I just waited for everything, I would have missed out on a lot of fucking things. And I don't wait on things and it's ideas to execution. If I waited on things, I'd still be talking about having a podcast. Yeah. And look at now we're 40 something. We're almost going to be March is going to be 50 something episodes. And we've had an episode every single week since we started. Yeah. Haven't missed one. What episode is this? 50 what? This is 45. 45. 45. It's going to be the most watched episode. It probably but will be. Let's do it. But no, for real. And yeah. then you can also look at that too as if the timing could have still been better. Because yeah. I look, I'm like, if I would have started doing this three years ago when nobody was doing this, I like, I'm just like, man, you know what I, I mean? I kick myself all the time. Yeah. I'm like, what if I started this three years earlier? Because we were probably thinking about something, right? We'd be on a jet right now. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> They'd be paying us yeah. 50 Gs to go talk to people. Let's make it a goal. The next podcast us four do together, let's have it on a jet. I don't down. know how the sound would be on that. We'll uh, figure it out. But we'll figure Ricky's it out. Ricky's like, I got that, it. Yeah, okay, <laughs> Ricky's our guy. We'll, we'll like, make it happen. That, that would be dope if we would do that. That's just fun to talk about. I'm definitely, uh, cool. there's going to be a day that the podcast is, like, I want the podcast guest. This is probably, this is like a five-year goal. Yeah. Where the podcast is done, like, where it's like, I text someone, I say, hey, we're going to grab dinner in Chicago. Yeah. Go board the jet. Do half the podcast there, then do a summary on the way back. Right. And then, like, that's the podcast every week. Dude. Just flying somewhere for dinner, taking that person out, giving them an evening and everything, and then the podcast is flying there and flying back. And it's crazy when that day happens, you're going to be on to the next. Like, you will enjoy You'll be like, okay, when you have time to reflect, you'll be like, I, I said it. but and it's And that's what makes all of this fun, right, is I think all four of us are committed to self-growth. To the point where we understand we're chasing something, but we understand the chase never ends. And like the chase is a hell it's healthy for us. Progression, you find happiness. One hundred percent. That's where that's where it's all gonna stem. So um we will link everything for you under below. Yeah. Instagram channels, Facebook, everything like that. Um, I think this podcast could go for hours. Right. But could, yeah. Once again, thank you very much for being on. Any final thoughts? No, I do have a final thought. Let All me right. do it real quick. Um, and I'm, I'm saying this to just to everybody, including myself, that the, the day you decide to be a badass and the day that you do that grueling schedule that you wrote yourself, know that there's somebody else out there that that's their bare minimum. And I, that's just stuck in my head because, like, every day, um, you know, you hear Dane and you hear other, other celebrities and you hear other people say, I'm the hardest worker in the room. That's how to make sure you remain the hardest worker in the room 
is remembering that what you're doing on your most baddest day, like badass day of the year, somebody else does that. Somebody in the world does that as a bare minimum. That's a bad day for them. And that mindset, it's a, that's a mindset you adapt. And it's, it's humbling and motivating equally, equally going forward to the point where you're humbled enough to realize, like, I need to work harder. But then you're motivated enough to be like, I'm glad I'm at where I'm at. That'd be my final. I love it. Yeah. That's solid. The chase is always on. There's always coming, always someone coming for you, and there's always someone you're going after. Yes. So thank uh, you guys so much. Thank you again. Thank you. That's going to conclude the M3 podcast. Uh, I don't know who's over there. We're going to key Lauren. Thanks for listening to the M3 podcast. M3 podcast. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. Want to learn more? Check us out on Instagram at Moss Marketing Group, on Facebook at 